Uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start off uh, today by thanking the organizing committee for this wonderful opportunity to come together and commemorate. Um, I think it is the birthday, not the death, yesterday. Is it? July 26th. July 26th. By a month. Yes. Because I always, I, yes, I like, I like celebrating births and not deaths, yes. <laughs> for some reason. Yes, my mother would prefer to celebrate and remember our father on his birthday. There you are. Without knowing, I would agree. Um, so, uh, although almost uh, 50 years have elapsed from the publication posthumously of Haidt's major work on Ottoman criminal law, the erudition of this book, Nay Unfinished, rightfully has categorized it as the most important study in the field. Many times I have personally reread the book to find yet another reference or an odd comment that has opened new avenues to my research. And it would be fair to say that um, with regard to this book, the devil lies in the footnotes. <laughs> Um, and this is, I believe, the recipe for the immortality of this work. Ambitious as I might have been when proposing the title a few months back, what I would like to discuss today with you is some aspects of Ottoman criminal law and justice that due to their nature render the system a utilitarian functionality, if I am to borrow the term from trademark law. Menage in his preface of, to the book quoted from the research report of Haid that the aim of the book was to, quote, systematically investigate Ottoman penal law and the administration of criminal justice in the Ottoman Empire in the 15th, 17th centuries, end of quote, in an effort to unravel the development of Ottoman criminal code, and again, quote starts, the only major secular code of penal law in a Muslim state before the westernizing reforms of the 19th century." End of quote. And I would like to start from this point today, uh, since current scholarship has gradually questioned the secular character of Ottoman law at large, and move beyond the dichotomy of shacht between idealized Islamic theory and down-to-earth practice. The Ottoman latecomers as they were in the Islamic world were viewed by the European observers with awe in the 16th century, suspicion in the 17th and 18th centuries, and contempt in the 19th. When they were declared the sick man of Europe, 19th century ideologies, and in particular nationalism, distorted even more our views as the nationalism of succeeding states in the Balkans and the Arab world declared the Ottoman Empire as the villain and the main culprit for backwardness, while the newly founded Turkish Republic distanced itself from its Ottoman past. Notwithstanding the conflicting interest of these nationalisms, they seem to agree on few characteristics of the Ottomans that remained immutable. A, that the Ottomans were pragmatists in government and that they were not as observant Muslims as other nations that joined the Islamic gate world. And here I normally make my joke uh, with my students. I say that uh, the Ottomans' relationship to Islam is like Coca-Cola light. Uh, it looks the same, but it doesn't have the same taste. The repercussions of these axioms, however, are quite interesting. Anything new the Ottomans introduced in Islamic polity was due to their pragmatism, as if the Umayyads and the Abbasids were less pragmatic, whereas the heterodoxy of the Ottomans served two purposes. A, the early republican aspirations of secularism, where secularism was an almost genetic characteristic of the Turks inherent in the Ottoman Empire, see the discourse on Kanun, and B, since the Ottomans were bad Muslims, what they achieved was merely a caricature of what Islamic law should have been defined as merely practice. Thankfully, 
Recent scholarship has questioned both these assertions, and now we can finally listen to what the Ottomans thought about their system, without dismissing their voices as mere attempts to legitimize the omnipotence of the Sultan. My focal point today will be twofold. A, I will attempt to see how the Ottoman administration dealt with thoughts and punishment, and B, I will make some general remarks about the philosophy of their justice. Uh, I hope so. Anyway, whereas the Kanunames and the Sicil entries provide us with numerous examples of imperial justice, I will concentrate on Zimis and utilize their ecclesiastical and communal registers. And I do that on purpose because criminal law in particular is an area of law when the state has the upper hand, normally. So concentrating on Zimis and torts is an interesting way of seeing how the system works. Choosing Zimmis in particular as the empirical target group stems from their position in the inherited Islamic Ottoman society. Two concepts, both anachronistic, are used to analyze Muslim and non-Muslim relations. That of tolerance, a 1960s construction made famous with the broad Lewis book when following the different rights movements, the Western society was inventing a fictitious model of coexistence. And on the other spectrum of analysis, that of inequality. The position of non-Muslims in the Islamic age societal pyramid based on Ahliya, a well-worked construction of Islamic jurisprudence, was used as an example of Islamic intolerance. Although complicated habitation, dress, behavioral codes elaborated by Islamic jurisprudence defined the boundaries between different subjects, and they were diligently repeated in early Ottoman jurisprudential manuals widely disputed in the empire, in terms of equality, we have to acknowledge that the Hanafi prescription of allowing non-Muslims to claim the right of retribution and blood money from Muslim culprits of homicide at an equal rate to that of a Muslim victim could be the closer example to equality, even in death, we can come up with. Therefore, looking into the way Ottoman justice functioned for those down the ladder would be revealing on the degree of success or failure an Ottoman subject had to attain justice. To make things even more complicated, I will use Orthodox Christian records, 17th, 19th century, and attempt to discuss their overall utility, the interplay between Ottoman imperial law and local Zimi custom, and finally the concepts of punishment and coercion in the early modern Ottoman society. And this was the boring part. Now, I'll show you a case. Ta da! 18th of November, 1741. This is from Paros, Parikia. I don't know whether you would be able to read the whole thing. It is quite an interesting text. Uh, it is registered in the notarial book, which is at the same time their uh, communal court records. This is the place where they put their decisions. And it relates to a man who, according to the community, is an Eglifesad is somebody who is always creating trouble. The entry starts over telling you how many things he has done, and he has done a lot of things that are related to sexual promiscuity, uh, attacked houses, tried to get virgins, uh, beat up people, and nothing happens, you know? The community doesn't do anything about it until the day one of the upfront members of the community comes down to negotiate certain things with foreigners that have come to their place, and he sees an argument. The fomenter of corruption, the Eglifesat Vasilakis, is uh, verbally abusing some foreigners and refusing to pay his debts. When the upfront member of the community comes over and tries to scold him about his behavior. He uses foul language to reply, and this is it. This is the, 
this is the end of this behavior. They decide immediately that they don't want him anymore. They have decided that they want to withdraw support from his person. And um, they hand him over to the head, the epitropos, of the community leaders, who is going to give him to the Ottoman authorities to be punished. Now, what would the punishment be in his case? Most probably since it is 18th century, he's going to be sent to the galleys, but uh, because this is what normally happens. This is a very interesting uh, entry because it gives us in a nutshell what actually happens on the ground in terms of um, Ottoman criminal justice. So, uh, the community decides the moment they are going to expel a member they consider irretrievably um, bad. Uh, and this is an example of how, in actual fact, the Ottoman law worked. The Ottoman law was basically, or Ottoman justice was basically based on um, keeping people from doing bad things. So, in case they have done something, there are ways of not punishing them by sending them to jail and so on and so forth. You get an aman, you confess that you have made a mistake, then you have personal guarantors, kefil binafs, that you are going to behave again, and you don't go to jail. Only when the community is convinced that you are not reformed, your life gets into danger, or your property, in that manner. So, uh, the way the communal court has decided, the procedure, the logic, the philosophy, is exactly the same like the one in a court. In uh, 1695, in Ottoman Crete, we have an entry in the Cadicetial record where the prior of monastery of Sabathiani, Papa Gabriel, is accused of exactly the same things. How? He has paid some killers to kill another Christian. They have confessed but they cannot punish him according to the Ottoman procedural law. The wife of the deceased has tried, but it led to nowhere. So the community decides to take action. They bring him to court this time, and they all give the same testimony. Papa Gabriel has the reputation of a man always doing bad things, facade. He attacks honest women, same, children, family men, disturbs them day and night. Because he is a fomenter of corruption, a cliffesad, we are all disturbed. Although we have many times given him warnings, he did not reform. If he is to be let free, he is going to continue and we will scatter around and vanish. This is a good threat. So, the entry finishes, as it is proven beyond doubt that he is a fomenter of corruption and because he had of his character, he is sentenced to service in the imperial galleys. Most probably Vasilakis must have had exactly the same uh, fate. So, this is just one example of how you can come for similar kind of uh, crimes to the same end through different ways and methods. Why would the local authorities not go to the Cadi court immediately for something? Is an issue that um, keeps coming into my mind and there were many times I have thought 
since they have the choice to take somebody to the Cadet Court, why wouldn't they do that and try to fix it among themselves? The most logical explanation would be, looking into the Schiette of Terlere, that um, they are trying to avoid the Echliot from coming inside their community because this is going to create trouble and it's going to cost. Therefore, keeping them out and keeping peace is one way of sorting out problems. But if this is the way it is, then we'll have to be thinking about what methods these forums, bodies, had in order to impose their decisions upon, uh, upon their members. In other words, the coercion methods they use and whether these coercion methods are more successful than the Ottoman almighty state. This is the question to ask. And for that, I will have to say that when it comes to community courts, they have a very way, beautiful way of forcing people to accept their decisions. Fines. So this is our decision. If you don't follow it, you are going to pay the tax collector X amount of money, which is quite a few of us languish. Second, if you don't do this, none of us is going to support you in any of your court cases in the Cadi Court. You are not going to find any witnesses. Withdrawal of communal support, which is essential in the system. So we have two methods of coercion that are extremely successful when it comes to persuading somebody to do what they have decided. Talking about coercion, when we get into ecclesiastical courts, we have different form of coercion, and this is the excommunication, or the threat of it. Because metropolitans were writing letters, I will excommunicate you if you don't do blah, 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 blah. And that was, in an early modern society, a very powerful tool of imposing a decision. A powerful tool that has been used not only by the Christians, by the Muslims too. Uh, I will find the exact date because I can't remember it. 1640s, the Aga of Athens goes to the Metropolitan of Athens and says, look, I need to get my money. I went to the Cadi court and uh, I can't get my money out from the Christians I have lent it my money. So, can you please issue a communication letter so I can get my money? Wonderful way. Works, coercion. Now, that method will have to make us think about this formalistic, almighty system we have created about the Ottoman Empire. Sultan, Kadi, Ehliorf, doing it all on the spot, and it works. And think more creatively about how punishment works in the multicultured, pluralistic Ottoman society. Um, I was supposed to tell you, give you examples of the coercion from 1703 and 1809. I will show you the, no, I'll show you this later. These are the entries, normally signed properly with witnesses, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we get into what sort of torts we find in these courts. Petty theft, damage of crops, illegal appropriation of movable, immovable property, gasp are some of the issues that local communities dealt with without involving the Cadi justice. And they did it on the basis of what they call our local custom, URF. Now the interesting thing is that custom is an oral thing, this is what we know, blah, 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 blah. But in 1647, from 1647 onwards, they start codifying their oral custom. And they say that they do so 
so that uh, we decided to register our ways and the rules will be eternal, bounding us, our children and their children. Why? Because custom was changed by the powerful against the weak ones. So if we codify it, if we write it down, if it is in the Notaire book, nobody would be able to change it. Now, what sort of things, as I said, all kinds of thoughts are inside and the punishments are there. For theft, you have fines and strokes. For murder, you have the payment of blood money of 10 gurus. Attack by fists is a fine of one and a half gurus. Um, swearing against God, 40 actions and 20 strokes. 20 strokes is the punishment if somebody creates a scandal in a within a married couple, cut, basically. And when we look at all these rates, we also figure out from the entries that um, they uh, adjust the rate in time. So something like 30 years after the codification I have mentioned to you, there is a case of uh, blood money where we see that the 10 gurus has become 40 and then daily nafaka is supposed to be paid to one of the kids uh, deceased until he comes of age. Um, yes, how much? Five minutes, all right. So the next case is a case of rape. And this is more difficult from petty theft and bodily harm because that, uh, uh, if you look into Hades Ottoman criminal law, thank God the Ottomans were sensible enough to realize that rape cannot be part of Zinna. So therefore, there is a specific punishment for those who do it. Um, the last case is 1752. In the presence of the Voivoda of Syros, Haji Ibrahim Aga, the epitropi, the upfront members of the community will come over and discuss the claim of a father who says that his daughter has been raped, a child has been born, and he asked for money for the child and the mother. The interesting thing is that in this entry, they quote their own codified custom that says that if a woman has done it on her own accord, there's no rape, she actually did zina, no money should be given and the woman should be taken away and banished from the island. But if the man has actually raped her, then this is verified by witnesses and it's condemned to service in the galleys. Why am I, am I telling you this? Because in the bibliography so far, all those cases have been presented as cases of legal autonomy of the non-Muslims, blah, 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 blah. But when you actually look closely, you figure out that this local custom stems from Ottoman custom, Ottoman law, that Ottoman law has become the local custom of these people. And it is integrated within the system nicely instead of the legal autonomy that we were told it is about. So, a number of questions we are supposed to ask. What is the essence of these bodies? Uh, why some communities developed codification of local customs and others not? What is the nature of punishment, implementation of decisions? The correlation between local customary no norms and imperial jurisprudence, what is the validity of these decisions, and so on and so forth. So it goes on and on and on and on. To finish, I'll have to say two things. The first thing has to do with the, um, of whether the Kadid justice could be implemented as easily as we think <coughs> it was. We keep forgetting that the Ehli Earth was a private story, just like it was in Venice. So you get the Hujet from the Kadi, and then you pay the Ehli Earth to go and implement it. 
I have very many cases in the ecclesiastic, in the communal courts, when the Ecclesiarch actually negotiates with the people he's supposed to arrest, and new situations come out of this. So this legal positivism that we have this idea of a court that implementing the decisions on the spot is not quite what exactly happens on ground. And finally, yes, custom is respected. Custom has always been an important source of law for the Ottomans. In the article, in the presentation I have sent you all over, I'm arguing about custom, about change, about custom being a vehicle for creating new norms as society changes because law is supposed to be parallel with the society it represents. We have this scripturalistic idea of the folk as an unchangeable thing and when something that happens does not fit to this idealized fiqh we have in our mind, then it is because it is mere practice. But this is not what the, the John Gia Fendi said when he managed to equate Kanun with Siasa Saria, using actually the ideas of Ibn Qayyim, Ibn Taymiyyah's student, who was discussing Siasa Saria, who has put up all this system of a workable fiqh. What the Ottomans have done by accepting custom, basically, not uncontested, and I have given an example in the article, which I have no time now to discuss, about how um, it is custom is discussed vis-a-vis -vis Islamic law. Um, it is a way, a vehicle for change, which is important if you are supposed to retain one of the most important concepts in Ottoman legal justice, which is the omnipotence of the Sultan as the source of justice. Something that in the 17th century, a humble priest in the Balkan city of Ceres thought that it was the most important safeguard for his felicity, the sultanic justice. And it was not, as we are told, a legitimization vehicle of some few intellectuals that were discussing the circle of justice. On the contrary, for Papa Sinadinos, it was what made him safe within this system. So, in conclusion, what the Ottomans have managed to create by allowing these mechanisms, by giving it an importance to custom, by allowing change to an evolving society, was what I call a living Sharia. Not the scripturalistic Sharia that modernism has imposed to us from the 19th century that things should be, but the fluid Sharia we have seen through the fetvas of our Ottoman Sheikh Islams. Not the Siasa Sharia of Ibn Taymiyyah, which is an ulema Sharia that again, although it temporarily solves problems of procedure and allows it to work, does not give space for change. This is, I believe, the most important contributions the Ottomans have done vis-a-vis -vis the development of Islamic law. Thank you very much. Ah, if, I, if I may, one second, one second. These are all, okay, okay, okay. Now I have to go back. These are all the things from the archive. This I like very much. Can you see the Sukudul Hal in Ottoman? 
Can you see the stamps? The stamps are from the Grand Dragoman and from the Kaimakam of Istanbul, who in 1678 concluded this transaction in the Ecclesiastical Court in the Pachekit. These documents make us think, boy, why didn't, don't, why didn't the Kaimakam go to the Kadi court? Huh? Let's think about it. Thank you.